Hello again, it's time for lesson nine. Today we're going to study the quantum simple harmonic oscillator. First we're going to review the classical oscillator. Then we'll work out the quantum Hamiltonian. Then we'll talk about the so-called operator method for solving the quantum simple harmonic oscillator. And finally, this operator method produces these things called ladder operators. We'll figure out a couple of nice features of those guys. And uh, this is just going to be the beginning of a, of a really a two-part session on uh, the quantum simple harmonic oscillator. So there will be more next time. All right, let's talk about the classical simple harmonic oscillator. You guys already know that the energy is the sum of the kinetic and potential energy. In the infinite square well, the only energy that mattered was kinetic energy, but now we have a potential energy that is finite everywhere, but uh, its value depends on position. So now we have a potential that goes like 1 half kx squared. You also are aware that the classical solutions to this problem uh, are cosines and sines. In other words, the position goes like a cosine, the momentum goes like a sine. If you plug those two functions back into the energy, you find out that the, uh, the total energy is constant. So that tells us we're talking about a simple harmonic oscillator without any damping, without any interaction with the rest of the world, and that that energy goes like the square of the amplitude. So those are the main points. Also, uh, one thing you may recall is that the frequency of the oscillator is related to the mass and the spring constant. So there's a classical natural frequency that's uh, related to the, the mass and the stiffness of the spring. Okay, so what about the quantum simple harmonic oscillator? Well, we can start with the same energy idea, but now we're going to convert it into an operator. So energy now is going to become the Hamiltonian operator that acts on a wave function, and we're looking for wave functions that have the property that the Hamiltonian uh, hitting the wave function produces a number times the same wave function back again. Of course, wave functions that have that property are called eigenfunctions, and the number that you get is called an eigenvalue. How do we find these functions? Well, that's what we're going to be doing most of today. First, we'll replace the momentum in the classical expression for the energy with the momentum operator. That means that anywhere p shows up, it's going to become uh, minus ih bar ddx. If we plug that in twice, then we get that the kinetic energy term looks just like it did for the infinite square well. But now the potential energy term is no longer zero. Now the potential energy is proportional to x squared. Now the trouble with k is that it looks an awful lot like wave number. And so to avoid ambiguity, we're going to replace k with the mass times the natural frequency squared. So instead of k, we're going to use m omega squared. It means exactly the same thing. It's just a different way to write the spring constant. And, uh, and that's all there is to it. But it avoids us having too many k's floating around. OK, so what is this operator method? The operator method is to start with the Hamiltonian. Notice that it looks like it might be factorable. You guys know that uh, a squared minus b squared is a plus b times a minus b. Well, you can play a similar game. Look at this as the difference of two squares in a way, except one of the things is complex. So if I rewrite this as minus i a p hat plus b x times plus i a p hat plus b x, I have a hope that when I multiply all that together, I'm going to wind up with something that looks like the original Hamiltonian. Let's try it. Let's see what happens. If I, uh, if I call the first factor, we're going to call that a plus. The second factor, we're going to call that a minus. These names are traditional names for these operators, but uh, we'll see in a little bit why they have the plus and the minus and what the significance that has. But, uh, but let's go ahead and, and plug in these definitions, multiply everything out, and then see what happens. Notice that if I want this to work out to be the original Hamiltonian, then h bar omega times capital A squared had better be 1 over 2m, because I need to get p squared over 2m. And, uh, and h bar omega times b squared had better be a half of k, or a half of m omega squared. So b squared h bar omega has to be m omega squared over 2, because I need to get 
one half kx squared there for the uh, for the potential energy or m omega squared over two. Uh, with those requirements, that determines that a has to be the square root of one over two m h bar omega, and b has to be uh, the square root of m omega over two h bar. And also, of course, if you multiply those together, you get that the the factors in the middle with an a times b in them um, are just one over two h bar. Now, one thing you might be confused by, I've got minus IAB p hat x plus IAB x p hat. Now, if momentum and position were classical variables, those two terms would just cancel. But they're not classical variables. We're doing quantum mechanics. And so that means that p hat times x is not the same thing as x times p hat because these are operators, and it turns out they interfere with each other. They change. The, the order matters. So if I rewrite this out um, with the order intact, I get this term x p hat minus p hat x uh, in the middle. But I also get the correct value for the kinetic energy term and the correct value for the potential energy term. I just have this annoying extra term. And I've written it here with square brackets. It's uh, square bracket x comma p hat. Okay. That thing means x p hat minus p hat x. It's called a commutator. And it's a standard bit of terminology in quantum mechanics. Whenever I have two operators that don't, uh, that interact with each other or that where order matters, that means applying them in one direction is different than applying them in the other direction, I can define a commutator. How do we figure out what that commutator is? The easiest way is to apply it to an arbitrary function. So if I apply x p hat minus p hat x to an arbitrary function, I get something. It's called the commutator. I get the value of the commutator. If I actually put in the definitions of x and p hat, and then notice that I've got f prime on the left, but I've got the derivative of x times f, which is going to be f plus x f prime on the right, and I cancel all the bits that cancel, I end up with something that's not zero. I end up with ih bar times f. So the commutator of x and p hat turns out to be non-zero. It turns out to be i times h bar. Now I can take that result and plug it back into my original expression. And you can see what I get is that the, uh, the kinetic energy and the potential energy are there, but I've got this annoying extra little bit, a half of h bar omega. But uh, I had hoped for just the kinetic energy and the potential energy. But all is not lost, because if I write the Hamiltonian as kinetic plus potential, and I write out what I got with the uh, two factors, a plus and a minus, I just have this extra half h bar omega. I can fix things up if I simply add a half h bar omega to both sides, and I get a good expression for the Hamiltonian. It turns out it's my factored bit plus a half of h bar omega. Now what good does this do? In class you're going to show that the commutator of a minus and a plus is also not zero, that they don't, that they don't commute with each other, that they interfere with each other, but that commutator is just going to be one. We're going to use that fact to find new solutions to the simple harmonic oscillator if we can only discover one. So let's suppose we have a solution, we'll call it psi sub n, and we know that that solution uh, satisfies the time-independent Schrodinger equation. In other words, the Hamiltonian acting on psi sub n is the energy of the nth state on psi sub n. What happens if we apply the Hamiltonian to this state? that we get after applying one of the latter operators. So let's apply the Hamiltonian to a plus on psi n and see what we get. Well, what we get is the Hamiltonian acting on a plus. I've rewritten the Hamiltonian in terms of the latter operators, but notice I can distribute the a plus inside the parentheses. And then I can factor an a plus out on the left. So that's kind of tricky. As long as I don't change the order of the a pluses and a minuses, I haven't changed anything. And notice that I've rewritten it in such a way that it almost looks like I've got the Hamiltonian there. The trouble is the Hamiltonian is a plus a minus plus a half, and I've got a minus a plus plus a half. But the commutator of a minus a plus is one. In other words, a minus a plus is the same thing as a plus a minus 
plus 1. So I can replace a minus a plus with a plus a minus plus 1. So let's do that. So that gives us a 3 halves inside. I get the 1, I get the a plus and a minus written in the opposite direction. And uh, I want you to notice that uh, now I do, in fact, have the Hamiltonian, except I've got an extra h bar omega. So a plus a minus plus a half times h bar omega is the Hamiltonian. I've got three halves, so that gives me an, an extra h bar omega. But now the Hamiltonian acting on psi n, we already know psi n is a solution to the eigenvalue problem. So I can replace Hamiltonian on psi n with the nth energy eigenvalue times psi n. And now everything in parentheses there is just a number, which means that it, it commutes with any operator. So I can, I can swap the order of that number and a plus, and we've got our answer. In other words, let's review what we did. We, uh, we took the Hamiltonian acting on the state a plus on psi, and we showed that that's equal to en plus h bar omega on that same state, a plus psi n. So a plus psi sub n is a new solution to the time-independent Schrodinger equation with an energy that's h bar omega greater than the original energy of the original solution that I started with. So what we found is that the latter operators give us new solutions. Now I haven't shown it, but it is true that the uh, a minus operator also gives a new solution. It turns out to be a solution whose energy is h bar omega less than the energy of the solution you start with. Okay, now let's look at a, a little vPython demo to get some sense of what these solutions actually look like. Okay, so here is the ground state wave function of the simple harmonic oscillator. Notice it looks a little bit like the ground state of the uh, infinite square well, except in that case the wave function comes down and goes to zero at a finite location. This wave function behaves like a Gaussian. This is the n equals zero state of the simple harmonic oscillator. There's, there is no n equals zero in the infinite square well. It starts at one, but, uh, but numbering aside, this is the ground state, the lowest possible energy state. And you can see it's symmetric about the center, but the function goes to zero only asymptotically. So it doesn't go to zero at any finite value of x, but it's uh, very tiny out past a certain, certain distance. The, uh, the first excited state looks a lot like the first excited state of the infinite square well. Um, it's also uh, anti-symmetric, just like the n equals 2 state of the infinite square well. This is the n equals 1 state of the simple harmonic oscillator. Um, but again, it doesn't go to 0 at a finite value of x. It goes down gradually. And we're going to learn more about exactly how it goes and, and why it looks that way. Um, now the ground state rotates at a frequency that's related to its energy. Remember, this is n equals zero, so that means that the energy is one half h bar omega. Um, the first excited state spins faster, but unlike the infinite square well, in which the first excited state is four times the energy of the ground state, this one is only three times the energy. It's three halves h bar omega and the n equals 2 state is 5 halves h bar omega. So it's 5 times the energy of the ground state. Um, now the probability densities of these guys look about like you'd expect, sort of a lump in the middle, or for the first excited state it's 2 lumps, or for the n equals 2 state it's 3 lumps, and so on. And of course if you put two of them together, just like the infinite square well, you're going to get sloshing. So here's the sloshing probability density um, associated with the superposition of n equals 0 and n equals 1. You know, it's very similar in character to the kind of sloshing and behavior we got uh, with the n equals 1 plus n equals 2 state of the infinite square well. Now, as we go to higher and higher energy levels, um, you can see that the basic behavior uh, stays more or less the same. It's a little bit like the infinite square well, but uh, it's a little more well behaved. If I add a bunch of uh, terms from the different energy levels together, I get a kind of a bouncing back and forth. This almost looks like a, 
an object in a classical simple harmonic oscillator wiggling back and forth in the uh, in the well in the quadratic potential well in this case now the other thing I want to point out is that uh, these other states like that's the n equals 7 state I guess yeah n equals 7 state notice it's got seven humps and it rotates at uh, a frequency, let's see, that would be uh, n equals 6, so that's going to be 13 halves, I guess, 13 times the ground state energy. And uh, But similar to the infinite square well, the, uh, it, it wiggles just like the states in the infinite square well do. One thing I would like to point out is that the uh, probability density of these humps is larger at the ends than it is in the middle. And part of that is due to the fact that in a simple harmonic oscillator, when something's wiggling, it's going to spend more time at the ends, spend more time at the edges of its motion, uh, because it's going fast in the middle and it's going slow at the edges. And the other thing to notice is that, again, um, the probability density falls off asymptotically to zero, but it's never zero for any finite value of x. So that's how that works. Anyway, we'll get used to looking at these pictures uh, as time goes on, but uh, that's sort of that's sort of what it looks like.